Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hey, buddy, my name's Scott. I am an alcoholic. Now, I love the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I love the people. And I always start off and say it has not always been like that. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to thank the committee, Connie, uh, Mike Powers, my my host, and Sticky Hand Mikey. Um, that's a that's an inside joke. There is his real name is Smikey because they call him Smiling Mike. And um, the hospitality that the Gopher State Roundup has given my wife and I is just absolutely phenomenal. I have the opportunity to be back here. I hadn't been back since the international. Uh, you guys put on a heck of a show at the international. Yeah, you really did. Yeah. You know, I, I, I think I'd like to start off and tell you that you're never going to have a better sobriety date than the one you got, so you might as well keep it, okay? <laughs> you're never going to have the best story in AA, so you might as well keep that one too. I, I didn't hear those things when I first came in Alcoholics Anonymous almost 40 years ago. I um, I didn't know that even at that young age I was in an absolute fight for my life. You know that alcohol was going to rob it any gold dream aspiration I ever had as a kid on the things I wanted to do and the things I wanted to become. I didn't know that when I put alcohol in my body I was going to try to overcome an obsession I had no control over. You know, and that drink was going to demand another drink. We learn to share our experience, strength, and hope here, talk a little bit about what we were like, what happened to us, and what we're like today. Uh, and we do that in a general way. You know, when we get up here and we give a talk, uh, we maybe give 3%, 5% of our stories. We never can give it all in, in the short time that we're allotted. Um, that's another thing. I don't consider myself a speaker. I consider myself a talker. Okay, the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous says one alcoholic talking to another no lectures to endure, no axes to grind. And so I believe that if you speak from the heart, the heart listens, okay? And we just heard that a little earlier, didn't we? Um, yeah. You know, my story is not the story of drinking out of a brown paper bag at the age of five. I hear people talk about that sometimes. That's not my story. Uh, I grew up in an Irish Catholic neighborhood. I'm from Boston. I grew up in the projects. I grew up in the neighborhood. Uh, being Irish and Catholic, I drank as young and as often as I could. The drinking age was 18 in Massachusetts, and so I started at a young age. And when you were in the Irish pub, Kelly's pub, whatever the, the pub was, if you had money, you could drink. You know, you could drink. And it was just part of the culture growing up in the neighborhood. Um, I didn't understand anything about alcoholism. I didn't un understand anything about this disease, this illness. I didn't know that it was a family illness. It, it talks in our book about the warped lives of blameless wives and children, the sweet relationships that get deadened. My dad was an alcoholic, and he was that tornado roaring through our lives. Um, you know, the police at my house all the time, bruises on my mom's face, crying at night, the, the silence, all the things that, that we hear people share about um, happened growing up. You know, uh, it talks about defiance being one of our chief character traits as alcoholics. I was very defiant. If you were a teacher, a babysitter, you know, a police officer, you tried to tell Scotty what to do, I rebelled against that. And so I had a lot of the, the selfishness, self-centered, self-seeking behaviors that we as alcoholic display, uh, even at a young age. You know, that was before I even really started drinking, driven by those hundred forms of fear and self-delusion. I even made decisions at that young age based on myself, which placed me in the position to be hurt by others. Now, I didn't know any of this stuff at the time. I um, would go to Al-Anon meetings with my mom. I know we got some Al-Anons here. I'd like to welcome Al-Anon family groups. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're still going to try to have fun tonight, though, okay? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ooh, I love Al-Anon. That's a joke. No, I do. I... I, I would go, 42 years ago, I was going to Al-Anon in, in uh, South Boston and North Quincy, going with my mom, and, and there were no men in Al-Anon at the time. You know, I'm a young kid, and I would go to Al-Anon with my mom, and to me, there were just a bunch of women sitting around the table complaining about their husbands and the way they were being treated. 
And my dad was the alcoholic type that sat down the street in his van and would be drinking and drive home, follow us home, and then beat my mom up and call her a whore and who was she meeting there. He knew she was doing something, talking about his business and stuff, and she wasn't doing any of that. She was she was trying to find a better way to raise her four boys in this terrible uh, grip of alcoholism in the family. And it is a family illness, okay? You know, and, and that didn't work, Al-Anon, with my mom, and, and I tried Alateen. Alateen are for children of alcoholics. I know we have a big Alateen present uh, this weekend. And, yeah. And I, I would take the trains into Southeast, South Boston and stuff and, and go to these Alateen meetings, and, and the honesty of it is I didn't get anything out of Alateen because I didn't want anything out of Alateen. You know, Alateen was a place for me to go and manipulate and get you to feel sorry for Scotty and the way I was being raised. So I, I didn't get anything out of it, you know. And then drinking, you've heard people uh, talk about how they grew six foot tall, you know, they could talk to women, uh, they could dance. That was not my experience when I drank alcohol. It didn't make everything okay. What, what happened to me is when I started actively drinking, it was just that <sighs> I could breathe. You know, that's really what it was, is I could breathe, because I believed I, I was in a world I didn't belong. And if you just leave me alone, I'm going to be okay. You know, one day I'm going to do this, and one day I'm going to do that. And um, while I'm drinking, getting into that vicious cycle, even at the young age. I had my first arrest when I was turning 13 years old for assault and battery on a police officer and drunken disorderly conduct. And uh, got sentenced to Alcoholics Anonymous for myself. And, and I went to AA in that young people's group, and the youngest young person was like 30 years old, <laughs> okay? You know, this is when the second edition was still out, and they talked about losing cars and homes and families and going to jail and just all the, this insanity, and I didn't relate to them. I didn't even have a driver's license, you know? I mean, they, there's different customs all over the country, and how it worked in, in Massachusetts at the time, Boston and Quincy, is they never did any readings of a portion of Chapter 5 from the big book on how it works. They didn't read more about alcoholism. They didn't read A Vision for You at the end. These were customs that were started in Southern California. And, and the meeting would start and the meeting would end with the Lord's Prayer. That's all it was. And there were commitments. And you couldn't share unless you had 90 days. And they would interview you when you came in at Alcoholics Anonymous. Literally sit you down and interview you to make sure you even belong. And that happened to me. You know, I raised my hand as a newcomer. I was there from the courts, and, and some of the old-timers gathered me into the corner, and, and they started questioning me on, you know, all the jokes you hear about, you got to watch, you can't be an alcoholic, and they start questioning me. And when I say the old-timers, I'm talking about the guys that had, like, 30 days and 60 days, you know. <laughs> the guys that really knew the program, okay. You know, their sponsor said, go talk to this guy, and... They came over and talked to me, and they basically precluded me from AA. They, honest to God, they said that I was too young, okay, that I was more of the juvenile delinquent type, and that maybe if I could just learn to deal with my anger, I would be okay. You know, chapter 3 more about alcoholism talks about the self-deception, the experimentation that we'll try to prove ourselves exceptions to the rule, therefore non-alcoholic. And even at that young age, I was going out there defending my right to drink. You know, but I had to go to AA because of the courts. I had to go to AA because of my mom. The first step where we admit we're powerless over alcohol that our lives have become unmanageable was real easy for me to admit that to the judge or my mom or whoever. But I never accepted that to the innermost self that I had a problem. I really believed that I just had bad luck and I was too young. And so I kept going out there. And we, we know the vicious cycle. I mean, I was in my first detox at 14. I was at Skid Row eating out of dumpsters and trash cans at 16. Um, trying to find a better way. I started making the rounds to the homes of the bewildered, as my friend Jim Buckley would talk about, getting strapped to beds, pump of lithium, thorazine, chloral hydrate, Haldol, you know, all these wonderful drugs being diagnosed as suicidal, homicidal, manic depressive. Uh, they call it bipolar today, I guess. And, you know, I loved it because years, <laughs> years later when I read the book, when I finally did the deal, uh, in it, it talks about the different types of alcoholics. It says, and then we have the manic depressive type, which is probably the least understood amongst us, of which a whole chapter could be written. And then they didn't write the chapter, okay? <laughs> that was my chapter, okay? They never wrote it. And so I'm getting diagnosed with all these things. And i got to tell you, really, right now, is I was misdiagnosed. What I am is I'm an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. A lot of those behaviors that I had displayed were common manifestations of alcoholism. 
Okay, but you couldn't tell me that at the time, so I'd run with it. And I love it in our book too. It talks about we seldom told the psychiatrists the truth. I never told them the truth. They would show me those ink blots too that Teresa was talking about, and I would say it's a battleship coming down Hancock Street, blowing houses up on the left and right. I would make this stuff up. Okay, I didn't really see that, but they were sure writing a lot of notes when I was saying that stuff. <laughs> You know, and, 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 and I'm in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. Never read the book, okay? Never worked the steps. I, I would hear things, I, I, I'd hear things like just don't drink and go to meetings, okay? You know, I never heard about that 12-step program of recovery that brings us back from the gates of insanity or death. I didn't know that this process that we go through that it requires for its successful consummation is out of the book. It's through the action of the, those steps. And, and I had a lot of misconceptions on what AA was and AA wasn't. You know, find someone that you can relate to. Get a sponsor. Um, I don't know about you guys that are new, but I didn't relate to anyone because my case was different. Okay, You just didn't know. You just didn't feel the way I feel. Feel You, you weren't raised the way I'm being raised. Uh, all the excuses. But I wanted to do something different because I kept getting into all these jackpots, you know. And when I say jackpots, I'm talking about the drug and alcohol rehabilitation programs that shave your head, make you wear dunce caps, sit on the bench, clean dumpsters with toothbrushes, uh, the scared straight program of the 70s where you go in all these major prisons and these tough convicts would come up, give me your shoe, I'm going to bend you over, you know, and they'd start telling you what they're going to do to you when they get you in there to try to scare you straight. And, you know, I had been in AA a few years, and I decided maybe I need a sponsor. And, and how it worked, with, when I talk about the diff, different customs, is, is let's just say, for instance, that Mike is my sponsor. And I'm going to take, why are you laughing? And I'm, <laughs> oh, Mikey. And uh, I'm going to take a medallion at, at, at this meeting. Well, Mike would get up here and tell you all about me. And he would tell you, Mike, not only AA and the steps that I'm taking this year, Okay, you like that this year? Um, but my community involvement and just the things that I'm doing in life. And then I would get up, accept the medallion, say a few words, and sit down. And this guy, Fred, was one of the youngest young people in the group. He was like 33, and he was taking a four-year anniversary medallion. His sponsor got up and said all this wonderful stuff about Fred. And then it was at St. Castrosinum's Church. And Fred got up, and he accepted the medallion, and he was looking at it, and he says, you know... He goes, I was really nervous this morning because I knew I was going to have to get up here in front of all you people. So I smoked a joint to take the edge off, okay? <laughs> and he went on, and, and I got to tell you, I love what Fred had to say, okay? <laughs> and that meeting got over, and I went right up to Fred and asked him to be my sponsor. <laughs> that was my first experience with sponsorship in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now... <laughs> Now, make no state, mistake here. Years later, when I, when I read that book, when I took that prescription that's outlined in it, Dr. Silkworth closes all those loopholes when he says that we can't take alcohol in any form, okay, that the only treatment we have to offer is complete abstinence. See, I wasn't taught that. It, it was a little different because you didn't share about drugs from the podium of Alcoholics Anonymous. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. That's an outside issue. And that, back in the early 70s in Boston, that's how they treated it. So you didn't talk about drugs. If you did, um, you were pulled off the podium. There were many of my peers that were doing Darvon, Librium. For you young people, these are some of the old drugs, okay? Darvon, Librium, you know, and smoking weed and stuff and, and claiming sobriety just because they weren't drinking. And that's not sobriety. You know, and it would just be a matter of time before I would try that program <laughs> of theirs. And our book says we can't bring to sufficient force the pain, the misery of a week or a month ago. We succumb as so many of us do one more time, and I would drink. And then the drink would take a drink. And then the drink would take me, and I would be off and running one more time. You know, so the whole 70s to me were just a bunch of um, misconceptions on what Alcoholics Anonymous was and what it wasn't. In and out of one institution after another, DYS, Division of Youth Service, it's like a, you know, juvenile jail I don't know what they have here in Minnesota. Um, always trying to find a better way through all those other outside issues because I'm a I'm a garbage pail, okay. And I will try acid was really big in the 70s, and and uh, I would try just about anything to try to make me drink more, drink less, uh, to function. We call it the magic elixir. The book refers to it as gin and sedatives. However you want to put it, that's what I was trying, uh, trying to find a better way for myself and just. 
crashing and burning at every turn. You know, I ended up getting a girl pregnant, and that didn't work. I, I figured I'd settle down. I was senior in high school. I quit. I was in a culinary art program, four-year culinary art school, and uh, I quit and married her. And two weeks later, she was home with her family. She came from a rich Irish Catholic family. I came from a poor Irish Catholic family. And the attitude was I didn't even need her anyway. But inside, I felt so shameful. You know, I couldn't even do that right. And uh, she was pregnant, and I found myself in the combat zone in Boston. Those of you that have been to Boston in the 70s know it was a red light district, a uh, very bad area, and I found myself in there with a few of my buddies rolling prostitutes. And if you don't know what that is, it's robbing them. And I ended up getting arrested for armed robbery. And I went into the Charles Street Jail, the oldest jail in New England, five tiers. And I walked in like that Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder movie, Stir Crazy. You know, that's right, we bad. And I walked in there, and a guy got thrown off the fifth tier, and he got killed. And it scared me to death. You know, I had heard all the things that happen to cute little punks when they get you in there. And I was cute. I had long hair, and I was cute, and I was afraid. <laughs> Come here, boy. Yeah, you with the tight jeans, right? <laughs> I was scared. And Ma Massachusetts is a Commonwealth law state. You have the right to face your accuser. If they don't show up three times, they dismiss it, lack of prosecution. Well, I had gotten bailed out three days later. And, you know, this life that we're leading becomes the only normal one. We can't distinguish the true from the false. And it talks about the jumping off point that our souls become really, really dark. And, and yeah, it's talking about suicide. And I, I didn't want to go to prison for eight to ten years in Walpole State Prison. I, I knew AA didn't work. Psychiatry didn't work. None of this stuff worked for me. And I just decided that I didn't want to live like that. And, and I went home to this little dingy apartment I had. And I climbed in the bathtub. And I set up the stereo speakers. And I rolled a half a dozen joints. And I drank a six-pack of beer. I was already drunk. And... I uh, took a razor blade and I cut my wrist all the way down, 110 stitches in each arm, and I bled out. And that's how they found me uh, the next morning. got rushed to the hospital, and five days later I came out on the critical list. And you hear people joke about that they can't even die right, they can't even do that right. And I felt like such a failure for that. And I found myself in another homes of the bewildered, strapped to a bed, and I'm fighting that case, and I end up beating that case. And uh, there was another suicide attempt there. I was very suicidal in the 70s for some reason, and uh, I had a bad 70s. And I, I, I took 200 nitol sleeping pills and stuck my head in a gas stove, okay? And uh, when I got found that time, I, I never talk about this one. Uh, those of you that have heard me before or heard part of my story, I don't really talk about this one. But I, I literally, I, I talk like, like this for two weeks because of those drugs and stuff just killed my sinuses and my brain. And they didn't know if I would ever come out of it correctly, but that's how I talked for two weeks. I scared myself that time. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and, and I ended up, you know, being okay. I beat the case, and, and that suicide attempt there, I found myself at Medfield State Hospital, strapped to the bed one more time, and this woman came and saw me. You know, she told me about this guy named Jesus Christ, that if I accepted him as my personal Savior, that behold, everything would be new. And you know, she talked about a loving, caring God. And um, growing up Irish and Catholic, my God sat on the throne, took a record of everything I had ever done wrong. And I was being cast in the lake of fire. I had an aunt that was a, a nun. And, you know, just all the things they tell good little Catholic kids that are going to happen to you when you touch yourself impurely. And, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you're going to go blind and all this other stuff. <laughs> I stopped in time. <laughs> I did. <laughs> but these are the things, and she's telling me about this guy named Jesus Christ. So, you know, alcoholics of our type, we go from one extreme to the next. We're either really, really good or we're really, really bad. And I, uh, I went for this program, Hook, Line, and Sinker, and I went into a program called Teen Challenge, okay? And I quit, I quit smoking, swearing, watching TV, stopped listening to rock and roll. I started going to Bible study seven hours a day. You know, church seven days a week. I, I entered the ministry. I was going to become a preacher. I started traveling New England, giving my testimony how Christ has saved my life. I would go into the born again Christian revivals and rooms not quite this big, but they would be talking in tongues and passing out. And um, you know, I'm I'm that square peg just trying to fit. You know, the, these Christians had something in the eyes, 
Something in the eyes that I wanted. You know, it's sort of like some of these old timers that are sitting here. They get that shit eating grin, right? They, <laughs> you want it. You don't know what it is, but you want it. And it was the same thing. I wanted to fit so bad. And our book says we're actors, right? We can be more demanding or more gracious that, that, as we want, okay? And that we're still trying to get our way. And so I'm that square peg trying to fit in. I'm three months into this program. I'm three months away from a drink. I'm three months away from my solution. And I decide, you know what, I really want this really bad. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get filled with the Spirit like they are, and I'm going to pass out. And so I would be in the revival, and I'd get filled with the Spirit like they and I'm falling out like they are. The only problem was I'm hurting my neck and my back, and I'm getting hurt, okay? <laughs> They're not getting hurt. And the reason why is this is a real spiritual experience for them. For me, I'm acting, trying to fit in. So... So what I do is I decide, okay, I decide what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak in tongues. I'm a quick study, right? That's what I'm going to do. So you got to follow me here because I call this my throne of judgment because, see, now, okay, I'm starting to judge this. And I decide I'm going to speak in tongues. So I start making this up. And I'm speaking in tongues, making it up. And Doug over here starts interpreting what the Spirit's telling him that I'm saying, Okay. <laughs> So I know he's full of crap, okay? <laughs> I know it. Because I'm full of crap. Now this whole thing is full of crap, okay? Now the first step where we admit we're powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable, unmanageability simply means not achieving one's purpose. I knew that I was not achieving my purpose. I had conceded to the innermost self that I was an alcoholic. I had a drinking problem. I had come to believe that this power was going to restore me to sanity. I used to think that the second step talked about the sanity of the world, and I used to have a real problem with that because things that I did that I thought were sane and I looked at, you know, just the opposite was insanity. And I really misunderstood uh, what that step was talking about because what it's talking about really is the insanity of the first drink. You see, when this mind will convince this mind that it's okay to drink again, after everything I've done, all the jackpots I've been to, all the trouble it's caused me, all the heartache, everything, that this mind will convince this mind that it's okay to drink. That's the insanity that it's talking about, restoring me to sanity. Okay, Making the decision to turn my will in my life, nothing more but my thoughts and my actions over to this higher power. I had done that even in this program and being around AA for a while at this point. But what I had never done was a fearless and thorough moral inventory of myself, let alone admit that stuff to another human being. You know, I love it because they say we're not bad people, we're just sick people trying to get better. I was bad, okay? I did a lot of bad things, and it was time I started doing some good things. Or they say that, you know, you heard Teresa talk a little bit about being sensitive. The big book does say that the alcoholic is sensitive. And, but then the next sentence says, but it takes some of us a long time to overcome this serious handicap. My sensitivity is not an asset, okay? And I, I went to the director of this program and because the stuff inside me was like gangrene, you know? It was like gangrene. And if I didn't get it out, it was going to absolutely kill me. And so I told him I needed to get this stuff out, and he told me I didn't. He, you know, we started quoting scripture back and forth to each other. Because by that time, I, I was what you'd term a Bible thumper, okay? And uh, we're quoting scripture back and forth that I have the strength to face all conditions through the power of Christ Jesus. Don't you believe that? And we're going back and forth, and that defiance came up in me, and I told him what he could do with this program, okay? Now, see, I didn't understand that that, that fourth and step, fifth step was designed like, like a cup of coffee. Okay, is if you took a cup of coffee right now and went out to the sink and put it underneath the sink and drip cool, clear water into it, at the end of this meeting, go back and look inside of it. It's still going to be dark and dirty on the inside. See, and that's what I was, was still dark and dirty on the inside. The way the fourth and fifth step are designed is to dump that stuff so that maybe I can retain some of this good stuff, clear stuff, good moral values. And, and so... I'm trying through this program, through AA, trying to put all this good stuff in me, but the stuff inside me was killing me because I had never admitted this to, to God and another human being, the exact nature of my wrongs. And I walked away from that program, and I walked back into the projects with the firm conviction, I'm not going to drink anymore. I know i got a drinking problem. I know I do. I've conceded that. I'm just going to smoke a little weed, okay? Because that's really not my problem, okay? My, my problem is alcohol. 
and you know the story, and, and I don't say that to disrespect the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm well versed at the, the 12 steps, the 12 traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, the 12 concepts of world service that we have in Alcoholics Anonymous. They say that the steps are designed so that we don't commit suicide, the traditions are designed so we don't commit homicide, and that the 12 concepts are designed so we don't commit genocide in this organization, right? You know, and, and I'm well versed at those in, in, I don't say what I say to disrespect the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm telling you my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous at that time in the 70s, okay? And it was just a matter of time before I picked up that drink again, and the drink took the drink, and the drink took me, and I was off and running one more time wondering how it happened. Uh, sitting on this bridge, I tell this story to show the cunning, baffling, and powerfulness of this disease of alcoholism, the insidiousness of it, because I found myself sitting on a bridge in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, called the Bourne Bridge, 169 feet up in the air over the Cape Cod Canal, and I climbed up there drunk and brought a bunch of beer with me, and I was up there four and a half hours, and the state police had blocked off the bridge, and the Corps of Engineers and Coast Guard were down in the canal with spotlights on me, and the Good Samaritan Suicide Prevention League's talking to me on bullhorns, and, you know, underneath is this campground called the Bourne Scenic Park, and all the campers came out and set up lawn chairs and stuff, and <laughs> they're yelling at me, jump, you mother, jump, right? <laughs> And I'm going, damn, these guys are crazy. Don't they know if I jump, I'm going to die, right? You know, that self-delusion. And it, it was a big drama. Every time the SWAT team came close, you know, I'd say, I'm going to jump, and then back away. And <laughs> You know, they say we're delusional people. I'm up there thinking of, you know, Dillinger and how the West was won and the Indian Sioux chief and 200 braves and 10,000 cavalry, and today's a good day to die. And... You know, I'm thinking of King Arthur's court, I would have been a great knight. You know, <laughs> I'm thinking of all these things. And I'm full of resentment, okay? Resentment, the Latin word, recentari, refill, rethink, replay. And that's what I'm doing in my mind sitting up on this bridge. I'm thinking of all the crap growing up. I'm not thinking of good stuff, okay? I was taught a lot of good values and morals. And, you know, when I was nine years old, I saved a kid's life. And when I was in the Cub Scouts and got honored by the House of Representatives. And I joke sometimes about being trustworthy, loyal, helpful, friendly, courteous, kind, obedient, cheerful, thrifty, brave, clean, and reverent, right? I still remember those lessons that were taught to me. But see, I, what I'm sitting on this bridge remembering is, is getting honored and sitting on a stage like this, okay, and my dad being drunk not showing up. See, that's what I'm sitting on this bridge thinking. I'm thinking uh, coming home from school one day because I got caught sneaking out the night before and my dad grabbing me by the back of the neck and marching me to my room and he hands me a milk jug with the top cut off and there's a lock on the outside of my door and he throws me in and locks the door. And the room's so dark I can't see, I turned the light on and he took my window and sheet metaled and riveted it. Okay. And he would let me out in the morning to go to school and lock me in at night. You know, I'm thinking of those things. Now, I don't say that to, to talk about child abuse because the honesty of it is I didn't think of that as child abuse at the time. You know, that was the price for getting caught. That was the price that I paid for being a tough kid to raise and getting caught. But sitting on this bridge, these are the things I'm, I'm thinking. And then I had that moment of clarity we all talk about four and a half hours later. And my moment of clarity was, you know what, Scotty, there's got to be something out here for you. There has to be something. There's something you haven't tried. You know, you, you need to get down. There's something that you got to do. And then I had another thought. And I had an honest thought. Okay, And the thought that jumped into my mind was, you know what, Scotty, if you get down, you're going to look like a pussy to all these people that have waited all this time for you to jump. You got to jump. <laughs> and so I turned and I jumped. Okay. Now, I don't remember hitting. Uh, they say I died. The only bone I broke was my sternum bone and chest cavity, and that was from them giving me the pericardial thumbs, bringing me back to life. They don't do that because it can cave in your chest and kill you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You know, I'm going to fast forward here real quick. Two quick stories. About 11 years ago, I was giving a talk in Middleborough, Massachusetts. And uh, my mom was still alive. My older brother was there. My mom was there. My, one of my younger brothers was there. And I told the story about um, the bridge, just like I did. And the meeting gets over, and people are thanking you. And th this guy comes busting through the crowd. And he goes, oh, oh, I owe you an amends. I owe you an amends. I looked at him. I said, geez, I don't even know you. He goes, no, you don't understand. He goes, we were at the bar, and it came across the scanners that they had a jumper. He goes, so I rolled some weed, I got some Jack Daniels. He goes, and that was me yelling at you to jump. <laughs> he, 
He goes, and you did! <laughs> and he had like 10 years sober. Okay? And so, about five years ago now, I was giving a talk in um, Palm Desert uh, out at the ABC Club, uh, Keith and Sally Carpenter. And uh, they were real active in Al-Anon and AA at the time. And I was giving a talk, and I told those two stories. And that meeting got over, and this guy, real distinguished in a suit and tie, comes up afterwards. He shakes my hand. He goes, you know, I always wondered what happened to you. And I looked at him, and I go, I'm sorry, I don't know you. He goes, no, you wouldn't know me. He goes, I was the captain of the state police barracks in Buzzards Bay who called out all the rescue vehicles and stuff. He goes, and when it came across that you had died, he goes, I knew they brought you back, but I never knew what happened. I was a practicing alcoholic at the time, and he had like 22 years sober, okay? You know, you hear people joke, is that odd or is that God? But you got three different people, three different walks of life, one event, all sober members of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. But I wasn't done drinking. I, you know, I, I mean, I got out of that and I found myself in another home to the bewildered. Nothing was working. I was going to go to California, the land of golden opportunity. Hollywood started hitchhiking, made it to Pennsylvania. And, uh... <laughs> I don't know why I thought of this story real quick, but I looked at, I looked at Doug and this guy picked us up, me and this, this crime partner of mine picked us up and he drove us about 90 miles and he was in a suit and tie and he had a, a briefcase in the center of his station wagon and he lifted it up and it was full of black hash treated with opium. He had just come back from Peru, right? Looked just like you, Doug, okay? <laughs> Doug's holding his chest, oh! And, uh, anyway, through, um, Indulging, being drunk and indulging in that stuff, uh, I joined the United States Army out of Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Because <laughs> what I needed was discipline, okay? That's, <laughs> that's what my mind told me. So I came out of a blackout in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, heading to Fort Benning, Georgia. And before my Army career was over, six-month Army career, they called me down for the Count Tranner. I was on the Benning House program of alcoholism, taking an abuse every morning in front of the CO, okay? And uh, before that was over, I was strapped to the bed at Martin Army Hospital, Ward B4, getting pumped full of all the drugs, and they gave me a Chapter 5 honorable discharge, unfit for military life. I went up to Massachusetts. That was it. I was done. I'm going to... California, you know, I, uh, the delusional people growing up in the projects, you know, I'm going to be discovered, I'm going to be a movie star, I'm going to be in a rock and roll band, all this stuff, and I went out to California, and I was out there six days, and I came out of a blackout, okay, we got any blackout drinkers here? Yeah? <laughs> got any projectile pukers? <laughs> got a few! <laughs> I loved everything about alcohol at that time, I loved it going down, I loved it coming back up so I could drink more. But I um, I came out of a blackout, and I was in L.A. County Jail, and there's nothing like coming out of a blackout, and you're looking at those pink slips trying to see what you were charged with, and the bottom line here is before that was over, um, between L.A. County, San Bernardino County, and Riverside County, I had 22 years sentencing in the state penitentiary in California, you know. And uh, those of you that have been in prison know that prison is nothing but a human kennel that breeds violence, and I let it breed the violence in me, and I became an absolute animal. I got tattoos all over my body. My attitude was, if you weren't white, you weren't right. I came from one of the most racial capitals of the country at that time in the 70s with fourth busing with Judge Sirica would bust the blacks in the Southie and all the hates and prejudice that I was taught as a kid growing up. I brought it into the California penitentiary with me. You know, I made it up to this institution called Tehachapi, and I, I was told they had a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and was I interested in going, and I went. I sat in the back with my Bonnaroos on, and it was Southern California H&I, and, and they started the meeting, and uh, they read a portion of Chapter 5 from the big book. I had been in AA 10 years at this time. I had never heard how it worked. First time I had heard how it worked. And then they read more about alcoholism, and they talked about the experimentation, the self-deception, that many of us would pursue this into the gates of insanity or death. And they were talking about me. And then this guy, Eddie Miracle, got up, and a couple of you may remember Eddie Miracle. And He said, you know, if you're new, you've come home. You need never be alone again. You're like the prodigal son who had to venture out there, and now you're home. He started talking about our glasses being half empty or half full, that this was a disease of perception. He started talking a lot about Chuck, Chee, Chuck C., Chuck Chamberlain, and that 
you know, we're all children of God. For me to love you for your color, you not for your color, that there's no room for hypocrites in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Either we're all God's kids or none of us are. What was my choice going to be? You know, and I believe luck and chance was passing me by, and I reached up and I grabbed onto it. You know, uh, people all my life told me what I wouldn't do and what I wouldn't become, and all of a sudden I'm sitting with people just like you, and you're telling me what I can do and what I can become if I was willing to put forth the effort and work for it. And so I jumped in AA like my very life depended on it. And if that meeting ended and they read a vision for you, and they, when he started reading it, I didn't know he was reading it, but he said, you know, our book is meant to be suggestive only. We realize we know only a little. God will constantly disclose more to you and to us. Ask him in your morning meditation what you can do each day for the man who is still sick. The answer will come if your own house is in order. But obviously you cannot transmit something you haven't got. See to it that your relationship with him is right, and great events will come to pass for you and countless others. This is the great fact for us. Abandon yourself to God as you understand God. Admit your faults to him and to your fellows. Clear away the wreckage of your past. Give freely of what you find and join us. We shall be with you in the fellowship of the Spirit, and you'll surely meet some of us as you trudge the road of happy destiny. May God bless you and keep you until then. And they're reading this, and I'm going, oh, that's so good. Where are they getting this, right? I've been in AA 10 years, never heard that. And you hear people joke, but my fundamental belief at that time was, do you want to hide something from the alcoholic? Put it in the book. Okay, it's the least... <laughs> Where I came from, it was the least read book in the rooms, I'm telling you, okay? And so I got sober, and I worked the steps, and, 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 and all the promises started coming true for me, even behind the walls. I went through a couple governors. I got my GED. I got four years of college behind me. I was becoming a gentleman, a gentle man, okay, even in there. And it wasn't so much a process of learning all these new things as it was a process of unlearning a lot of the things that I was taught and I was ra raised with. You know, that process of uncovering, discovering, discarding all the things we think we know, because that's what was getting me in trouble. And I, and I went for this underwater diving program that Chino had started. There were only 11 institutions when I was in under the old SP laws. I, I, governor Brown was the governor back then, and I think it's funny because now he's the governor again, you know, 30 years later, uh, Jerry Brown. But I went for this underwater diving program, and I got accepted into it. I came in second over all the institutions. And right before I was due to go, I got a notification that they couldn't accept me into the program because I had... See, when I say we leave things out of our stories, I broke my neck twice, my C2 vertebrae, uh, in drinking and alcoholism. And they said that I wouldn't uh, be able to stand the depths going down. It would stab my neck. And so all of a sudden, I was self-supporting through my own contributions, making 20 cents an hour at the time. Now I didn't have a job, and they stuck me on this fire crew uh, fighting fires up in Beer Valley Springs, and I'm up there, and... You know, the sun's coming up, and there's this tent trailer. We're in this town center campground, and I can see that there's a couple women getting dressed in this trailer. Now, you can't see them, you know, but, I mean, you can see their outline. And so I went up there by the bathroom, and the door opened up, and this young lady comes out with long, dark hair. And, you know, I looked, and I said, hey, how you doing? And she says, you think you can make more noise up here? And I said, well, we're going to be here all week. If you'd like to leave a wake-up call, we'll be here tomorrow, right? And... She got mad and went in the door and slammed the door of her camper, okay? So I knew she wanted me, okay? <laughs> she looked at me, right? We know the alcohol. She looked at me. She wants me. And so I went back to my cell that night, and I wrote her this letter. And, and I explained who I was. I was a poor Bostonian, and I was wondering if she could help me out and meet me in the bathroom for a quickie, okay? I had been down, I had been down for, you know, four or plus years at that time, and... I told her I was on a program of rigorous honesty, and I had to be honest and tell her there was no love involved with this. It was strictly lust. <laughs> and I snuck it out in my camp boots, stuck it in the bathroom. She came out the next day. I told her there was a letter there. And she went and got the letter, went in the camper, and locked herself in for like three and a half hours. It didn't come out. And then I started getting nervous because I figured, oh, if she gives this to the cop, they're going to rearrest me because you can't have contact with free people. And so anyway, to make a long story short, she came out, and I told her I was just kidding. <laughs> and she said, no, you weren't, right? And she said she couldn't do something like that, okay? And so I took the next tack and said, well, maybe we can write, okay? I'd like to introduce you to my wife, Kim, here, okay? Kim, stand up. <laughs> okay. 
So when, when I when <laughs> when I paroled, when I paroled, I was told I owed myself a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know myself with a weekend with my girlfriend or anything else like that. And I got out and I went to the Raptors in Newhall, California. It was my first meeting. A lot of H and I people. That Saturday night, I was at a dance at the Masonic uh, Temple in Van Nuys with you know Joe Gomez, Sonny Campbell, all these people, Greg Shea, Don Locke. Saturday, I was, or Sunday, I was at the um, uh, Pacoima meeting, and this guy's up at the podium, and he had a long beard, and he's banging the podium. The elevator to sobriety is broke. You must use the steps. And I'm, <laughs> and they called him Crazy Ted at the time, Ted Summers, who later became my sponsor. Okay, but that's how I met him. <laughs> And I was at the San Fernando breakfast meeting Monday. I was at my first panel in Acton, okay? And uh, Kim was a normie or so I thought. I didn't understand she had a drinking problem. <laughs> and she was up there to get away from the city. And so if she wanted to be with me, she's coming to meetings. And the bottom line here is after a few months, she ended up getting sober. She's got 28 years sober now. And yeah. <laughs> And all the dreams of Alcoholics Anonymous that we hear, the fear of financial, economic insecurity, we'll know new freedom and new happiness, all this stuff started coming true for me. You know, I started an attorney service in Los Angeles, a very successful attorney service, started making a lot of money. Um, I became, for lack of that better term, a circuit speaker, and I started traveling all over the country and sharing my experience, strength, and hope on what you could become if you were honest and willing enough to try. I had worked all 12 steps. I had had that spiritual experience or spiritual awakening, if you please, as the result of the steps. Um, I had panels at Tehachapi State Prison, Acton, Warm Springs, very active, had a home group, joined that rock and roll band I always wanted to join. I became a lead singer of a couple different bands. Uh, yeah, so all that money, property, prestige, bought a house in Valencia, built a custom home on Cape Cod. I would fly between Boston and L.A. four or five times a month, getting picked up by limousines and chauffeured wherever I wanted. I mean, this program really worked, right? <laughs> you know, making more money you could shake a stick at at that time. And coming from 20 cents an hour for years, um, money, property, prestige. You, know, you heard Teresa say earlier that um, she knows she had another drink in her, but she knew that if she ever did drink, she'd die. I'm here to tell you, you might not die. You know, you might have to live in that pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization day in and day out. Again, if we're not vigilant. See, we work the steps in order. But my experience is we can give the steps back in order, too. Having had that spiritual experience as a result of the steps, we try to carry this message. What is this message? This message is a message of hope. It's the promise of the freedom of the bondage itself. And I wasn't carrying that message anymore. I was carrying the message of, look at me, look at where I came from, look at where I am now. Okay? Me, 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 me. All right, enough about me. Let's talk about you, Kelvin. What do you think about me? Okay, see? <laughs> That's how I'm sharing, okay? I'm not seeking through prayer and meditation to improve the conscious contact with God anymore. I'm not continuing to take personal inventory and when I'm wrong, admitting it. Now, they say in AA we become as sick as our secrets. I started having a lot of secrets in AA and the lifestyle I was living. I would come into the rooms and I would start judging you. Ah, oh, geez, here she goes. Can't she come up with anything new, right? Oh, he's full of crap. He's cheating on his wife. You know, I would sit there and judge you in meetings, but I wouldn't say that to you. I'd be a good AA and say, oh, keep coming back. The program works. Give the nice step, a step away, seven, six. You know, I love it when we're entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character, and then we humbly ask them. In the 12 and 12, it talks about step six, that this is the step that separates the men from the boys, the men being the perfect objective, which is of God, and then my objective. Well, see, I'm back into my objective, okay? All of a sudden, I'm backed up all the way to the third step. You know, in the third step, it talks about the word continue, that the rest of my program depends upon how I continue, this thought and this action, 
this God-centeredness. It says we have no defense against the first drink. Next sentence, so except in a few rare occasions. That's willpower. See, I believe in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're going one of two ways. You're either going towards a drink or you're going away from a drink. You know, there's no middle-of-the-road solution. Even in AA, even with double-digit sobriety, I was going for a drink, towards a drink for a long time. But you couldn't tell me that because of the arrogance and the ego that I was displaying towards spiritual principles. And it says that the main purpose, the main, the main uh, purpose in our book is to show us precisely how to recover from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. The main object is to enable us to find the power that's going to solve our problem. And then in working with others, it says the main thing is that we be willing to believe in this power greater than ourselves and, uses the word and, live along spiritual lines. I wasn't living on spirit, along spiritual lines. Okay, I was doing things a married man shouldn't do. And I was killing my spirit. I was killing my, how could I do this stuff? And I'm coming into AA. I know I'm not going to drink. I'm an alcoholic. There's no doubt in my mind I'm an alcoholic. I can't do that stuff. I'm practicing a program of hypocrisy, getting up here, professing a belief in a system and a way out that absolutely rescues us and walking out the door doing something totally different. But I'm not going to drink. I know I'm not going to drink. I'm an alcoholic. Started using the, the big book as a weapon, sort of like we do the Bible. Not reading before and after the things, but picking things out of the book. Who are you to judge me? You know, Who are you to judge me about sex? God alone is the arbiter of my sex conduct. You can't judge me. You hear people sharing that stuff, they're usually cheating on their husbands or their wives or whatever, right? Because you can't judge me. And so I'm now I'm saying the 12 steps in the Ford, it says that there are, prin- there are a set of principles, spiritual in nature, that if practiced as a way of life, can expel the obsession and leave the sufferer usefully and happily whole. I wasn't usefully and happily whole anymore. You know, but I knew I wasn't going to drink. My sponsor died. Eddie Miracle had died. I didn't get a new sponsor because I know AA. Okay? I know AA. Mis- Mr. AA, Mr. Circuit Speaker. Until one day, I had no defense. Okay. The insanity returned, and I drank. Now, please understand that the big book in our program does not say that we drink and then get insane. It says the insanity returns, and then we drink. And that's what I did, and I turned my back on Alcoholics Anonymous, you people, my wife, my kids, my businesses, and in short order, and in short order, I lost absolutely everything. You know, I was on the bad part of town, doing all those outside issues that we don't talk about in AA, Drinking every day, trying to get that magic elixir back. Coming into AA, see, I never doubted that I was an alcoholic. I just didn't like the way I felt. See, (coughs) I'm a chef by trade today. And if you gave me a shovel right now and told me to go outside and dig a 20-foot hole without gloves, my hands are going to crack and blister and bleed. I'm not going to be able to dig that hole. There's no way. But if I go out for 10 minutes today, in 10 minutes tomorrow, in 10 minutes the next day, in a matter of weeks, I'm going to have calluses all over my hands. And I'm going to be able to dig that hole. My experience in Alcoholics Anonymous is you can build a callus on your conscience. See, because that's what I did through justification, rationalization, and just such arrogance towards spiritual principles. I would come in back into AA and people, well-meaning, well-intentioned people, you done now, you got enough arrows in your ass now, Mr. AA, you know. People I sponsored 20 years sober come up, oh, can I be your sponsor now? <laughs> oh, that would tick me off. I wouldn't say that, though. I'd get angry and I'd walk out the door and get drunk. See, I know what it's like. How many, how many people here are in their first year sitting in here now? All right, Welcome. I know what it's like to be sitting here with 10 or 11 days and make a decision that I'm done. I don't want to drink anymore. I'm done. And walk out the door and get drunk anyway. Now, Big Book refers to this as this type of thinking that when it's fully established in the alcoholic, he's probably placed himself beyond human aid and that unless locked up, he may die or go permanently insane. And that's where I had put myself one more time. Any part that leaves the physical out is incomplete. And I wasn't physically sober. And I couldn't get this. I wanted to get this thing. I needed to get this thing, but I couldn't get it. My wife, 
we were in a divorce, restraining orders on me. She looked at me and she says, you know, Scotty, I don't even think God could fix this relationship. You know, I had several restaurants at the time, too. And uh, <laughs> I don't know why this popped into my head. With all these restraining orders and stuff on me, <laughs> um, I would go to the restaurant and I had to stay, stand across the street. And my employees would have to bring me food because I couldn't even go and get food. And they would bring me in biscuits and gravy and to-go boxes, crazy autos across the street. You know, Bill's story says, one who had thought so highly of himself, <laughs> you know. And to make a long story short here, on Christmas night, 1996, December 25th, in the depths of despair one more time, I took a 25 automatic and I just, boom, shot myself in the head. And uh, I came to on full life support systems at the Antelope Valley Medical Center. My wife talks sometimes about getting that phone call and being there with me in the full tent, the catheterization and everything, not knowing if I was going to talk or walk or anything. You know, here we are thinking, I'm not hurting anybody. <laughs> you know, I'm just hurting myself. The warped lives of blameless wives and children, the sweet relationships that get deadened. And now I'm that tornado, and I came out of it, and this is where my story gets a little weird. Okay. <laughs> it does. <laughs> I still continue to drink, and the state of California stepped in, and um, they charged me with ex felon with a gun. Okay, <laughs> trying to kill myself. <laughs> yeah, go figure. And so. I had had nine felony convictions. This was my tenth felony, and I went into court, and I, I know, you know, we're actors. We, we know the game. This time's different. Please give me one more chance. I'm going to get sober. What I need is rehab, and I went in this Judge Chelsea McKay in the Lancaster Superior Court, and I tried that, telling him I need help, and he says, you sure do need help. <laughs> Boom, and he remanded me in a custody. So before that was all over, I find myself in Chino State Prison this very month, you know, 15 years ago, uh, 16 years ago, sitting in Chino State Prison, and they were striking me out, giving me 25 to life because they have a three-strike law in California. And I had a thought, and I had an honest thought, and the thought that jumped into my mind was, I want to be sober now. Okay. <laughs> I'll work the steps now, right, all this other stuff. Yeah, I'm real teachable now. And... Uh, you know, that relationship, that divorce that was so damaged, you know, my wife, she says she used to pray that God would do something, but she didn't know it was going to be that drastic. Um, started a letter campaign, and people from all over the country wrote this judge, um, Chelsea McCain, the Lancaster Superior Court. And if you've ever read, you know, the Bible or Daniel in the lion's den, Peter sitting there and the light coming and the chain falling out, that's basically my story, because on October 7th, 1997, Judge Chelsea McCain, the Lancaster Superior Court, pulled me out of state prison and he st stood me in front of him. He says, you know, I don't understand this. He says, you seem to have helped a lot of people. How could you do this to yourself? See, Bill Wilson used to talk about the cave of alcoholism. You know, and in that cave, the warp lives of blameless wives and children. It's the judge, you know, it's the car accidents, it's jail, it's whatever your moment is. And people will come to the mouth of the cave. You know, like they did to me, the priest and, and my mom and the judge and the doctor and say, Scotty, come on out, come on out. And they didn't understand I really wanted to come out. I just didn't know how to come out. And the magic of Alcoholics Anonymous, of one alcoholic talking to another with those no lectures to endure, no access to grind, when we get properly armed with the facts about ourselves, let alone alcoholism as a whole in the world, we can go in the cave. And we can take you by the hand and say, come on out. This is what we do. These are the steps we take. This is how we recover from the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And we're such good actors before that happens that we can build this pretty picture to our wives, our husbands, our kids that this time's different. Please give me one more chance. And we're such good con artists. They do. And then we drink again and burn the house down. And if we're honest about it, we don't know why. 
You know, and this judge, he didn't know anything really about alcoholism, but for some reason, God touched him, however you want to look at it. Uh, he struck two of my strikes right there, and he released me the next day. You know, and he released me with a five-year tail, of which I had to complete, and I jumped into AA like my very life depended on it. Um, not with the thought that I would be up here giving a talk, uh, not that I would get my wife and my kids back or any, you know, any of the other stuff back. I just didn't want to drink anymore. I wanted a primary purpose, and I used to have that primary purpose. You know, I wanted to get the passion back for Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, my friend Jim Buckley used to talk about what it was like at the end of his drinking, and he would give the the um, analogy of the guy in the gas chamber in San Quentin, okay, when they were about to drop that pellet. And they drop the pellet, and <gasps> he takes a deep breath. And he knows in the depths of his soul that if he takes a breath, he's going to die. And yet he equally knows that if he never takes another breath, he's going to die. See, that's where I was at the end of my drinking. I knew. We, we call it blotting it out to the bitter end, all these little things that we talk about. Uh, but I knew, and yet I drank anyway. You know, I, I, when I was in, they say we don't regret the past. I was to shut the door on it. When I was in the prison this time, they had me in high power because of my, my background and my violence and all that other stuff in, in, in the penitentiaries. And um, I got in a jackpot. I was in the hole for 28 days, and I got a hold of a piece of paper and a pencil because I knew how hard it was going to be to come back to Alcoholics Anonymous. How many people have tried AA? This is not your first time. Raise your hand. Seriously. Okay, how many people came to AA, got sober, and have stayed sober since you got here? I see that's how it's supposed to be done. Okay, I just wanted you guys to know that. Okay, that's how it's supposed to be. But I wrote this thing that when one who has wandered far into selfishness and self-centeredness seek to return to the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, he will encounter criticism and distrust. There will be those that whisper, he's a newcomer again. I don't think he'll make it this time either. Now, these wicked ones are doing not the work of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous or of their higher power, but of their own selfish, self-centered interests. They seek to drive the returning member still farther from hope and from sobriety. You know, let the returning member contemplate the rejoicing in heaven over the return of the one that was lost. Let him in no way be disheartened by the suspicion and scorn of others. He can again walk in the sunlight of the Spirit. See, because that's what I felt. This program was founded off love and tolerance, not the judgment condemnation we give each other sometimes around here. You know, and I jumped into AA because I wanted that primary purpose. I wanted the singleness of purpose back. And um, through sponsorship, through a home group, through H&I, through all the things that we have to do to become usefully and happily whole, I did. And I reassembled things with my wife and, and, and uh, my kids and made the amends and got to do a lot for Alcoholics Anonymous and started traveling uh, not only in this country but all over the country, uh, other countries in the world. I took my fifth anniversary and gave a talk at St. Paul's Cathedral, a part of the Vatican over in Rome, Italy. I led a meeting in Congress. Um, we were invited with my wife and I by the Speaker of the House to, to breakfast. With, I know Congress isn't that popular today. <laughs> That's an outside issue. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we were, we were in the Capitol and we were walking through there unescorted with generals and admirals and senators. And I'm looking at all the tapestry and stuff. And we go down to the private dining down there. And I was on parole. They never asked me. They never asked me, so I never told them, okay? You know, coming to these things, coming, coming, coming to these conventions where I love to get to see God show off, okay? And that's what He does in these things. He gets, He gets to show off with you people. And, you know, but I go into Herkimer County Jail every month. I go into the food pantries every month. I sponsor people. My home groups, the outsider groups in Herkimer, New York. You know, that, that relationship that I had damaged so bad, um, with that first son of mine, he's 33 now. I had made my amends. I had gone through the footwork, and it didn't do anything. He wasn't a part of my life for years and years and years uh, until the last few years. And um, he's married and got a few couple kids. My grandkids, I got five kids, five grandkids. Uh, I have a daughter that's 27 with a few kids, a son that served our military for four years, Afghanistan, all that. Um, 
saw things no young man should see. Got a senior in college, and then I got little Tommy. My wife came to me. She was 42, crying, and had an early pregnancy test. <laughs> That's Tommy. And uh, <laughs> Yeah, one year we had one in college, one in high school, one in middle school, one in elementary school, and one in preschool. That was a tough year. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> You know, and little little Tommy, you, you hear the stories, okay? You know, and, and see, I have I have business problems because I have businesses, okay? I have marital problems because I'm married, okay? I mean, think about that, okay? It rains on the just as well as the unjust, okay? It rains on the just as well as the unjust. These last 15 years of my sobriety. There's been heartache. I mean, I remember, you know, Teresa, God bless her, but when she was talking about her dad, I remember my dad dropping dead and flying back and, and uh, giving the eulogy and burying him and flying back to California and going right out to the Antelope Valley and giving a talk. And I was such a wreck, I freaking didn't have my belt on. I had to borrow a tie. You know, we learn to walk through these things with a little simple dignity. That's what we get to do. We suit up and we show up. A few years ago, I got the call from my wife because she got the call that my son Thomas had an inoperable brain tumor. And uh, he'd been having problems with his equilibrium and gained weight and all this stuff. And we couldn't figure it out. And so with the CAT scans and the MRIs, that's that's what they came up with. And and so I come home and all my family's there and and you're trying to be strong, you know, and your little 11-year-old is looking at you crying, saying, Daddy, am I going to die? You know, and you're trying to be strong and work these principles, and you walk out by yourself, and you call your sponsor, and you break down, and you start crying. You know? And then you go into Herkimer County Jail that night, and you carry the message of hope and the promise of the freedom of the bond of yourself, try to help another human being to achieve sobriety. Intensive work with other alcoholics saves the day when nothing else does. You know, we learn to walk through these things with dignity. Doesn't mean we don't have bad things happen to us. Because things do. But what am I going to do? What, what is really this? See, do I believe the stuff that I'm saying up here? Do I believe there is a God? Yeah, we can know that deep down in every one of us is the fundamental idea of God. Maybe obscured by calamity, pomp, the worship of other things, but it's here and it's only here that He may be found. It was so with us. But do I believe that when I say that? See, I gotta believe this stuff that's coming out of my mouth. You know, I used to be a parrot in Alcoholics Anonymous. Something would sound good and I'd pick it up off another speaker or whatever. Ooh, that sounds good. I'm gonna say this. Okay? Or I'm gonna say this and try to work it in. Okay? I don't do that anymore. I used to think, and this is the difference between the sobriety before and the sobriety now. I used to think that I was going to be the best AA, have the best home group, be the best service worker, best sponsor, da 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 That was my job. I didn't really understand is that that's not my job in AA. My job is to let him work through me as he would have me become, not what I would have me become. You see what I'm saying? It's going where he wants me to go, saying what he wants me to say, not what I think. And so it's totally different. And there's a lot of women in this room right now, and I'm going to share this experience because I'm, I'm running out of time. Um, but this sums it up about God to me. This woman, it was in Fredericksburg, Virginia. She was like 80 years old. She was taking a 30-year medallion. And she talked about what it was like growing up in the South. Okay. And on their block, they had a mammy. Mammy was a big black woman, and all the kids in the neighborhood would go and sit on mammy's lap. And she remembers sitting on mammy's lap, and she was rubbing mammy's arm. And mammy looked down at her and said, Child, child, my skin is as dark as the night, but my soul is as white as snow, just like yours. She's a little girl. She walks away. Fifty years later, in the grips of this disease, where it talks about us waking up to the hideous four horsemen of the terror, the bewilderment, the frustration, and the despair, she looked down at her skin, and she remembered Mammy when she was five years old. And she cried out to God in that surrender, and she said, My God, my God, my skin is as white as the snow, but my soul is as dark as the night. 
Help me, Father. And he did. She was getting 30 years sober. People wonder, that was her bottom. People wonder what, you hear the word bottom and you must reach bottom. And There's all different types of bottoms, okay? We all have different types. Yours could be the way a child looks at you. Hers was waking up looking at her skin. Could be going to the penitentiary. You, you know, it, whatever your bottom is, Dr. Tebow wrote a wonderful thing on what the surrender was. And simplified, he says, it's when our egos get deflated just enough, just enough, so that we can experience that psychic change sufficient enough for us to recover. That's the bottom. See, before I used to think in bottom because I would hear that stuff. Well, at least I didn't kill them. Well, at least this and well, at least that. And all my bottoms had trap doors. And I say that jokingly, but it's true because I used to think of a different thing. I didn't understand it was the ego getting deflated in that surrender so that I could have that psychic change. In the back of the book, it says that there's this principle that's a bar against all information, that's proof against all argument that cannot fail to keep a man in everlasting ignorance. And that principle is contempt prior to investigation. See, I thought I knew what AA was, and I thought I knew what AA wasn't. Today, it's all about the relationships that are unique and priceless to me. You know, it's suiting up and showing my sponsor said the most spiritual thing you can do, Scotty, is be where you say you're going to be when you say you're going to be there. Do what you say you're going to do when you say you're going to do it. You know, I used to read that 24-hour day book. I've probably read it in 40 years. I've probably read it 20 times, you know, throughout the years. Not every day is the meditation, the thought and stuff. And just a few months back, uh, I'm looking at the front of it, and I said, holy crap, what is this? I had breezed through it many, many times, and it was written by a 4th century Indian playwright, and it used to say the Sanskrit, because I used to always ponder in my mind, what is this 24-hour day plan? And it says, look to this day, for it is life the very life of life. In its brief course lie all the realities and varieties of existence, the bliss of growth, the splendor of action, the glory of power. For yesterday is but a dream, and tomorrow is only a vision. But today, well lived, makes every yesterday a dream of happiness, and every tomorrow a vision of hope. Look well, therefore, to this day. That's our 24-hour day plan. I never knew that. I never knew that. I say that every morning now. You know, you hear people joke about, I'm not the man I could be, I'm not the man I should be, but thank God I'm not the man I once was. But that's true. I read a book when I was in prison called Man's Search for Meaning. And it's about this guy in a Nazi concentration camp. And out of it, I got one little phrase that said, that man need not be ashamed of tears, for tears bear witness that man has the greatest of courage, the courage to suffer. It says we don't apologize for our God. Okay? We don't step on people either. I got this track. I always end my talks with this because it meant so much to me when you go back to your hotel room or if you're sitting in your hotel room watching this. <laughs> I think that's a trip. <laughs> Bob, put your clothes back on. <laughs> he told me, I'm going to be lying in bed watching you, Scott. I said, oh, what a vision for you, right? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh. It was a track that I was sitting in a cell, and I read it, and it hit me between the eyes. You know, back in the... 40s and stuff, uh, 50s, they used to have different stuff on the tables for AA, and they used to talk a lot about the four absolutes of honesty, unselfishness, love, and purity. And one of the things that they had was the upper room, and they had different spiritual meditations. And out of this, some anonymous writer wrote um, Norman Vincent Peale, and it was an un unknown author. I think recently they have just found out who it is, but this is back in 1982, when I found this and I read it and it just it hit me right between the eyes and I'd like you to think about this when you go back to where you're going tonight but what it says is that when you get what you want in your struggle for self and the world makes you king for a day just go to a mirror and look at yourself and see what that man has to say for it isn't your father or mother or wife whose judgment upon you must pass the fellow whose verdict that counts most in your life is the one staring back from the glass He's a fellow to please, never mind all the rest, for he's with you, clear up till the end. 
and you pass your most dangerous, difficult test at the man in the glass is your friend. Some people may call you a straight shooting chum and call you a wonderful guy, but the man in the glass is you're only a bum if you can't look him straight in the eye. You may fool the whole world down the pathway of life and get pats on your back as you pass, but your final reward will be heartaches and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. See, I cheated myself for a long time, both in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't cheat myself anymore. I didn't like my booze watered down. I don't like the program of Alcoholics Anonymous watered down. This is the real deal. And if you're an alcoholic, I'd like to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.